This is the Olympus OM-1 and there's a few shortcomings with this camera which I'm going to go through. So first, when you're doing high speed shooting with the mechanical shutter, the maximum speed is 10 frames per second. Whereas on the previous generation of Olympus cameras such as the EM-1X, it was 15 frames per second. So this is a downgrade from the EM-1X. Although you can get around this problem by using the electronic shutter and since this camera has less rolling shutter than the EM-1X, that would be a good way to counter that. Another problem with this camera is the autofocus. So autofocus is slower and the camera finds it more difficult to obtain focus in comparison to the previous generation of Olympus cameras such as the EM-1X, EM-1 Mark III, EM-5 Mark III. And also in low light situations, the camera is particularly bad at obtaining focus. So in scenarios where I was easily getting autofocus using the EM-1X or any of the other cameras such as the EM-5 Mark III, the OM-1 actually struggles. And this becomes even worse when you try to use the punch in zoom focus. So when you punch into the image to try to obtain focus accurately, it actually is more difficult for the camera to obtain focus. So if you're encountering this problem, the only scenario really is to increase your lighting or punch out. So just have the normal zoom image and then use autofocus to obtain focus that way. Another problem with the OM-1 camera is that the colors are less accurate than the previous generation of Olympus cameras, the EM-1X or EM-1 Mark III or EM-5 Mark III, so previous generation of Olympus cameras. The colors are a little bit more saturated than they used to be and in shadows you get a magenta tint and it's not just in shadows so this is particularly bad if you have people with dark skin color and you're filming them and you get a magenta cast on it it's obviously not good and that might be partially to do with the sensor but also partially to do with the calibration and the color science that they design into this camera so i think They've tried to increase the saturation of colors in order to make the images look good, but less accurate in comparison to real life and in comparison to how previous Olympus cameras would represent color. So this is something that's typically done on smartphones or consumer level cameras where they want to make things look good as opposed to accurately reflect what the colors are in a real situation, which was something that Olympus was really good at. And you can obviously play with a white balance to adjust things, but in my experience, I haven't managed to find a good way to do this in order to be able to compensate what the camera does. So here you can, you know, obviously change the white balance to reduce the magenta tint. But the problem is that it's not uniform so in shadows you get more magenta in other areas you don't so it, i find that leaving it as the default setting worked best for me another thing that you could potentially change to improve the colors are the picture profiles so if you go to the picture profile that you're using so i'm using custom and i'm basing it off the natural picture profile and here i can change the sharpness the contrast and the saturation. Now, if I reduce the saturation, in theory, that should make it more accurately reflect what the real picture would be like. But there isn't enough fine grain control to adjust the saturation. So you have zero, minus one, minus two. So what I find is when I go to minus one, it will be too desaturated. And when I go to zero, it's oversaturated. So it needs a little bit more fine grain control here so something between minus one and zero to get the exact accurate color which is seen by the naked eye and this is something that the camera can't provide so the colors are inaccurate but you also don't have a nice way of adjusting the colors so if you want to do post-processing that's fine but you can't change it in camera another problem with the OM-1 camera is that the auto white balance is substantially worse than the previous generation of Olympus cameras and one of the things you can do to get around this problem is to set the white balance manually. So you can choose custom white balance and then select the Kelvin value that you want. But the problem with this is that the Kelvin values 
go up in 200 increments. So if you wanted a more fine grain control of the Kelvin, you can't do that. I think the maximum size for this should be 100 Kelvin increments, whereas on the OM1 is 200 Kelvin. So sometimes you get into scenarios where you can't set it accurately. So that's not ideal. And what I find is with the auto white balance, the only time that it actually works effectively is in sunny conditions. So if there is shade or cloud or mixed lighting, the camera can't detect the right values to use. So setting a custom white balance is probably the best option. Another problem with the white balance is that you cannot change it during video recording. So if you set your custom white balance and during video recording you realize that you need to change it, you won't be able to do it until you stop the video recording, change it and then start video recording again. So this is something that you can easily do on some of the other cameras such as the Panasonic GH6 or GH5 Mark II. Another way to get around the white balance problem is to set a shortcut key where you lock the white balance. So on previous generation of Olympus cameras, you could lock the exposure, but you couldn't lock the white balance on its own. So this is something which is new in the OM-1. So you can lock the white balance setting. So if you're filming something and then you realize when the picture looks good, when auto white balance is picking up the right Kelvin levels, then you just press the shortcut key and that will lock the white balance for the rest of the recording. And then you can press it again to unlock the white balance if you wanted to. So that's one way to get around it. Another problem with this camera is that you cannot do backup recording. So you cannot record video to two cards at the same time. So this is something which is possible for photography, but not for video recording. So when you're recording video, it can only save to one SD card slot at a time. So the way to get around this is to use the HDMI output, record your video to one SD card, and then use the HDMI output to record with an external device. That way you have your SD card recording, but you also have a recording on an external device. So that's one way to get around it. But I think recording to two cards is a basic feature which is available in a lot of cameras. And since it works for taking pictures, I think they could also implement it for video recording. And this feature exists in lots of cameras, including the Panasonic GH6 and Panasonic GH5 Mark II. Another problem with this camera is that you cannot record video in 720p. So if we look at video resolutions, we can record in 4K or Ultra HD. We can record in Full HD, which is 1080p, and Cinema 4K, and that's it. So there's no option to record in 720p. And the reason why this might be important is because let's just say you're running out of storage and you want to reduce the amount of data that you save. So recording a 720p might be desired. So one way to get around this, if you're dealing with the problem of storage capacity is to use a lower frame rate. So maybe 25 frames per second instead of 30 or 60. Another way to get around this problem is just to record externally. So if you have an external device, then on your external device, you can set what resolution you want to record the video in. When it comes to 10-bit video recording on this camera, there's multiple problems. So first of all, you switch to H.265 and this will allow you to record 10-bit video. But none of the profile pictures which are available for 8-bit video are available in 10-bit. So if you go to picture mode, you only have two options. So there's the log recording and there's the HLG recording. So you don't have the option to select a picture profile like the flat profile or one of the other picture profiles that are available for normal video recording in 8-bit. So you can see these two options are grayed out. So if I press on them, I get a message that says they can't be selected because of the video codec. And same thing here. So this item cannot be selected. So they're not even providing a flat profile for the H.265 10-bit video recording. So that means that you have to do post-processing in order to use 10-bit videos, which is something I like to avoid. And I think at least they could have put in 
a natural picture profile or the standard picture profile so that for people who don't care but they still want to record 10-bit video recording you have one option which doesn't require post-processing and aside from that another big disadvantage is that when you record 10-bit video the image is really soft so it's not as sharp as the 8-bit video so I assume that the camera is not oversampling when it's recording 10-bit which it is doing when it's recording 8-bit video and the second problem is that there's a really bad rolling shutter effect when you're recording 10-bit video so in my case I tested it with 4k 60p and there was a really bad rolling shutter effect another problem with this camera is that the slow motion quality is bad so if you use slow motion the quality will still be bad so in comparison to the GH6 where you can shoot 4k at 120 frames per second with a full sensor readout this is nowhere close to that so this camera is performing better than the em1 mark 3 and em1x and em5 mark 3 but the quality of slow motion is still not good and i would say 120 frames per second is the fastest you want to go with even with 120 frames per second you lose quality but it, it might be acceptable whereas if you go above that it would definitely get become really bad Another problem with this camera, in comparison to the previous generation of Olympus cameras, is that you cannot use the shutter button to reassign it or have any settings for it in video mode. So in previous generation of Olympus cameras, you could have the shutter button to start video recording, and this is something you cannot do on the OM-1. I suspect the reason for that is that by default, they've already configured the shutter button functionality to start video recording, but only when you use the remote wireless control. So the new remote wireless control allows you to start video recording, and I suspect they've mapped it to the shutter button, because the only thing you can do with those remotes, because of the protocol they use, is to press the shutter button. So there is no option in that protocol for starting video recording so if they map it to the shutter button on that then you won't be able to do it on the camera itself so this is not a real problem and you can use the remote shutter to get around it or you can just press the record button but it's just something to be aware of in comparison to the previous generation of olympus cameras one really annoying thing about this camera is if you start video recording you cannot use the iso button on the camera to change iso so so there's an ISO button here on the camera, but this ISO button cannot be used during video recording. So let me start re video recording. Okay, so now you, see, you can see that I'm recording because of the red frame that's covering the screen. And that's our histogram there. It's all black because I have the lens cap on, but you can see a tiny bit of green there in the corner. So if I press the ISO button, you can see that nothing happens. I can change the ISO by pressing the ISO icon on the touch screen. And I can, let's just say, reduce the ISO and then go out. But once I go out, the histogram will disappear. In fact, whenever you use anything on the touch screen, the histogram will disappear. So the workaround is, is to press the info button to loop through the different views until the histogram appears again. So that's a bug in their system, I think. And if you're recording video in slow motion, so let's just say 120 frames per second, then the ISO can't be changed at all even using the touch screen. One major disadvantage of the OM-1 camera is its ergonomics. In particular, these two dials, so the dial in the front and the dial back here. So in comparison to the EM1X, these dials are smaller in diameter. So you only have a tiny bit of space here to move them. So this is quite difficult in comparison to the EM1X anyway. And aside from the diameter of these dials being smaller, which makes them more difficult to turn, also the thinner. So you have less surface area, which is connecting to your finger. 
and therefore less friction which makes it more difficult to turn these so you have to repeat quite a few times to just get a small movement whereas on the em1x these dies were bigger and thicker so they were easier to turn and if you compare it to the em1 mark 3 for example it, the em1 mark 3 the dials are small but they're on top of the camera so your movement is not limited to this so you can turn keep turning it with your thumb and aside from that on the em1 mark 3 the dials are slanted so even though they're small you get a larger surface area because the dials are slanted that's touching your finger so it's you know you get more friction and it's easier to move them and another example is this function button so the lever here is substantially smaller and more difficult to press in comparison to the other olympus cameras even the em5 mark 3 and the button here on top which is for the power button it's next to the evf so that's more difficult to press whereas on the other cameras it would be here or on the back i think on the em1x and well, and it was bigger as well so or longer so it was it was a bigger lever so you get more leverage to press that and also when it comes to menu navigation you have the menu here which you need to exit the menu and then you have the info button below here so you have to use the info button the arrow buttons the okay button the menu button and the back dial and front dial to change menu settings so when you're browsing the menu you have to use both hands and multiple fingers so you need to constantly have two hands on because you want to press the menu button to go out of a particular menu and then if you want to see something the info button is down here and if you want to go back to the dials then you need to move your thumb over here Whereas, for example, on the EM5 Mark III, the info button and the menu button are here. So you move through the menu with these arrows and then the info and menu here. So you can do everything with a single thumb. And if you want to go out of a menu item, you could also press the left arrow button or the menu. So a lot of the time you just press the left arrow button, which is quicker. And sometimes you go to the menu button, which would be here and the info button. Whereas on this camera, there's too much movement. So you have to readjust your hand to get your thumb down here. And then you have to readjust your hand again to get your thumb to this dial and then use the front dial as well and then the menu button with your left hand so it just makes it more difficult to navigate the camera maybe for beginners they find the new camera menu system easier to browse but for anyone that wants to use it quickly this is definitely more difficult so a lot more movement more hands more fingers are involved so i don't think this camera has the same good ergonomics that the previous generation of Olympus cameras had. For example, if you compare the SD card labeling, the top SD card is SD card 1 and the bottom one is SD card 2, but it's actually difficult to see the labeling. Whereas on the previous generation of cameras, this was more clearly indicated, particularly on the EM1X. Also, some of the menu layouts have been made worse. For example, when it comes to focus bracketing, you have focus bracketing in this menu, but if you want to do focus stacking, it's in a completely different menu item and menu grouping. Whereas on the previous generation of Olympus cameras, the focus stacking and focus bracketing were right next to each other, which is more intuitive. So if you're doing focus stacking and you see that your focus stacking is not getting you the desired results then you might switch to focus bracketing and then use those images to do post-processing afterwards so having the menu items in different sections doesn't make sense to me i understand that they've tried to put all the computational modes in one place but i do think that focus stacking and focus bracketing were best the way they were in the previous generation of olympus cameras Another disadvantage of the OM1 in relation to the menus is that there is less contrast between the menu text and the background colors in comparison to the previous generation of Olympus cameras. So it can be more difficult to see the menu items in certain lighting conditions or if you, for example, dim the LCD screen to save battery life. Whereas on the previous generation of Olympus cameras, the contrast was higher and also the background was darker, which emits less light. So that was a better color scheme, in my opinion. Another big disadvantage of the OM-1 
is this quick menu system. So if you look at the quick menu system on the OM1, it has substantially less options than was available on the previous generation of Olympus cameras. And also the live control menu doesn't exist altogether. For example, some options such as tone curve adjustment doesn't exist anywhere in the quick menu or even in the main menu. So the only way to get access to the tone curve is to change your button functions to adjust it that way. So let me just go to video mode. So in video mode, I've configured the tone curve here. So it's not actually configuring even the tone curve. You have to configure the multi-function option and then scroll through that, get to the tone curve. And after that, you can use the tone curve as that shortcut button. And another disadvantage in relation to the tone curve in comparison to the previous generation of Olympus cameras such as the EM1X is that the numbers are not shown here. So here you can see that I've adjusted my tone curve, but the numbers are not being shown. So if I want to know what numbers I've set for my tone curve, I have to press the shortcut button and bring up tone curve. And here I can see what settings I have. Whereas on the previous Olympus cameras such as the EM1X, the numbers would be displayed here. So just by looking at this screen, you would see what numbers you have for the tone curve. And another disadvantage of the OM1 in comparison to the Panasonic cameras is that the menu items can't be used with touch screen. So I think this is something we expect on the new models of camera to be able to use the menu items with touch screen. Although when it comes to the settings here on this touch screen, you can actually use touch screen to adjust things. So for example, if I want to set the ISO, I can do that and then go out of it. So as I mentioned, the live control menu has disappeared as well, where you would have settings on the right hand side and bottom of the screen. But because they've added all the options to use the touch screen on screen, that might not be a big issue. But the live control menu did have more options than what is currently available on the touch screen. Another problem with the OM1 camera is that it's not possible to change various camera settings during video recording. So for example, the tone curve cannot be changed, the picture profile settings, the white balance, and a few other things. I mean, you can obviously change your shutter speed, ISO and aperture, but if you want to change anything like the picture profile or white balance, or the tone curve, then you have to stop video recording, change the settings, and then start video recording again. And this is something I'm comparing to the Panasonic cameras such as the GH6 or GH5 Mark II, where those things can be changed while video recording. So some things like exposure can be changed, and you can use the white balance lock to lock white balance. But I find that that's not always enough for me, and I want to change more settings during video recording. Another problem with the OM1 is that the battery grip that comes for it doesn't actually have a DC port for powering the camera. So the workaround for that is to use the USB-C on the side of the camera to power the camera. But on the EM1X, you had both options. So you could power the camera with USB-C and you also could power it with the DC adapter. And the same thing for the EM1 Mark III. On the EM1 Mark III, you could also plug in the DC adapter to the battery grip. Another disadvantage of the OM1 is that when you buy the OM1, there's no battery charger included. So what you can do is you can buy the battery charger separately. But what's interesting is when you do buy the battery charger, it doesn't come with an adapter for it. So you've bought the camera, you didn't get the battery charger. And then when you buy the battery charger, you're buying half a battery charger. So either you need to use the DC, which came with the camera, or use a USB-C adapter, which you have from somewhere else. So I think the camera is really expensive. The battery grip is expensive. The charger is expensive. 
And talking about the battery charger, so when you do buy the battery charger, a problem with the battery charger is that when the battery is fully charged, the light switches off instead of turning green. Whereas on the previous generation of Olympus cameras, such as the EM1X and EM1 Mark III, the LED would switch to green when the battery was fully charged. So while the battery was charging on the previous generation of Olympus cameras, the LED would be orange and then once the batteries were fully charged, it would turn green. Whereas on the OM1, the LED will be orange and then it will switch off when the battery is fully charged, which looks the same if there's no power going to the battery charger. So if you see the LED is off, it's not instantly clear whether there's no power going to the battery charger or whether the battery is fully charged. So this is a regression in my opinion from the EM1X and EM1 Mark III to the OM1. To me, the OM1 looks like a camera that's been designed and made by a marketing team, as opposed to, you know, user experience team with, you know, in conjunction with engineers and photographers. Everything is kind of being geared towards marketing. And there seems to me that also there's a maximum attempt to extort as much money as possible out of the customers. So you have an extortionately expensive battery grip and an expensive battery charger and when you buy it it's not even the full kit and the camera itself is expensive as well and in terms of image quality when it comes to photography i'm not convinced that the image quality is better on the om1 than it was on the em1x or em1 mark 3 or even the em1 mark 2 but there has been some improvements so it's a mixed bag but i think with, for example with the coloring when they've tried to you know oversaturate the colors and a lot of things like that, it's, it's more like a marketing type of camera. I think they're just trying to target amateur photographers or people who don't know enough about photography, which I think will backfire in the long term. Whereas previously, Olympus cameras were really good in terms of the colors that they produced and also the attention to detail that they had about the ergonomics of the camera and the menu system and everything else. And I've looked online to see what other people say about this camera. And I've seen some Olympus fanboys actually not using the OM-1, but they're still using their EM-1 Mark II. And there's a quite few people like that. And I've seen people who upgraded to the OM-1, but then realized that the OM-1 cannot produce the type of videos that they want in terms of quality and rolling shutter and all the other features. So they had to switch to a different camera system for video work and ended up selling the OM-1. In terms of photography, I think the OM-1 is still good. But for videography, I think there's a bunch of features that they need to implement. And just by looking at cameras like the GH5 Mark II or GH6, that could give them a good idea of what they need to be aiming for, you know, in terms of being able to change camera settings while video recording and also having more accurate colors more options for picture profiles for 10-bit video recording dual backup recording to sd cards because if you can only write to one sd card automatically you're ruling this camera out for professional use anyway let me know if you have any questions about this camera or if you want me to compare this camera to another camera such as the em1x or em1 mark 3 